Um, I think what I might do is uh, um, just commence now and we can uh, get started. I hope our guests are able to uh, view the slides um, effectively. My name's Gareth Lewis, and, and I look after all of our, our work um, for the International Office at Western Sydney University. So uh, um, just on behalf of, of the panel here, I'd just like to welcome our, our guests to uh, Western Sydney University um, and the School of Medicine uh, presentation today. Um, what, what I like to do is just start um, so that all of our, our guests are able to just get a quick overview of our university with a little bit of information about us. Um, the uh, Western Sydney University, WSU, um, we are one of the uh, uh, universities in the top 2% in terms of ranking of universities globally. Um, Sydney itself is a, a city of about 5 million people, uh, the biggest city in Australia um, and like um, many cities in Canada, we're, we're a country of immigration. Um, uh, I'm a, a new Australian, uh, originally from the UK, and I've migrated out here. But what we find in Sydney especially, and, and many of the other cities here, is that there's a large influx of uh, immigrants from all over the world in Sydney. And what you find at our university is that the student body is a, a great mix of uh, uh, students who've got these origins from all around the world. So it's it's a great uh, melting pot. And I uh, appreciate in, in Canada, you probably have a, a similar kind of structure in terms of society there where you've got a big diversity um, of uh, different groups who've arrived in Canada to live. And similarly is the same in Australia. Of our international student cohort, um, we have about six, six and a half thousand uh, international students, but that's uh, mixed in with a, a body, a total body of about 50,000 uh, students in total. So Western Sydney is a very large uh, university in Australia with about 14% international. But as I say, that Australian mix uh, of students has this great um, cultural diversity. Um, 14 schools, and you're going to hear today from our School of Medicine about the programs. Just a little bit on our rankings. Um, we do uh, very well for a fairly young university. We, we've, uh, um, we were uh, commenced in the 1980s. Um, and in that time, as a, as a young university under 50 years old, we have established ourselves on the uh, international ranking scale. So Times Higher Education, you can see there the, the Chinese rankings of Shanghai Shaogong and QS, we're ranked very highly. And one of the things we always like to boast about is our, uh, our position in, on Times Higher Education impact rankings. So in the world, we are number three uh, against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we've done particularly well in that area. And we're number 36 in the world for universities under 50. Uh, quite an achievement. I won't, uh, I won't del uh, delay too long. The next few slides just talk about our overall rankings on Times Higher Education. I just want to highlight to you in uh, life sciences, preclinical, clinical and health, we're top 300 in the world uh, in that uh, particular ranking body. From QS as well, life science and medicine, top 400. Um, we do very well uh, overall for medicine, in particular, top 300 ranking. And again, on the Shanghai Zhao Tong rankings from China, clinical medicine, top 300. You're coming to a university that is recognized in terms of its uh, ranking in, in clinical health and medicine. Um, that's it from me, just for now. Uh, I wanna come back later with some information about entry requirements and application procedure and so on. But um, the, for the main part of this, I'd like to hand over to our School of Medicine and uh, um, perhaps uh, to Fiona to introduce the panel. Um, my name's you. Fiona Pacey, I'm the School Manager. And I think uh, for the School of Medicine, and I think what's important to note when Gareth starts talking about the um, performance of, of, the, of medicine in those rankings is that we're a relatively new school. Um, so having achieved uh, that recognition for a school that only started in 2007 and graduated our first cohort of students in 2011, um, we're particularly proud of. Um, I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Darug people um, and the two and uh, our campus at Campbelltown is on the lands of the Darug people. Um, the Indigenous communities of Australia is something that's very important to our school 
And we have found in the past that this um, focus has resonated particularly with Canadian students who have come to the university um, because of the similar recognition of Indigenous people in your country. So I have with me today Professor Gerald Munch, who's our Professor of um, Pharmacology, but also provides uh, support to the international students, in particular in years one and two of the cohort. And Dr. Ritesh Raju, also from Pharmacology, who's very involved in the coordination of the teaching activities in year one and two. So we just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the school itself, um, a little bit of the structure of the program, um, about the um, uh, facilities in which you would study, and then Gareth will outline some of the issues uh, around uh, entry requirements and enrolment. I think if we go to the next slide. So the course uh, is a Doctor of Medicine and MD program. It's a five year program. So in Australia, the, the programs that we call undergraduate, by which we mean that uh, you can enter um, directly from school, um, are usually five or six years. Um, we also into our program have students who've completed some or all of um, university elsewhere. Um, and um, that again provides for us a diversity of cohort, which is very, it, which is very valuable because students learn from each other and learn with each other. So some having come, um, we have some, some uh, parents with young children in our course and then people who've come straight from school. Um, some who've been health workers already, um, others who've got, undergone a complete career change. Um, and that uh, diversity, again, is good for the learning environment. So I might hand over, I think, to uh, Ritesh to talk a little bit about years one and two, which are the beginning of the program. Sure, thanks, Fiona. Uh, can everyone hear me well? All good, yep. okay. So years one and two uh, pretty much integrates uh, biomedical sciences uh, through the use of uh, authentic clinical scenarios we have in place. Um, some of the areas that we um, uh, uh, highlight ourselves in terms of teaching is uh, through lectures. So it's scaffolded by lectures, tutorials. We have practicals as well as uh, all covering different body systems in the first years one and two. And we also have a thing that's called uh, uh, problem-based learning. So that, that's one on the, on the, right on the top there, which we call classes PBL. Uh, this is where students actually in groups of 10s or 12s, uh, they work together on a uh, case which is actually being developed by the school and then so this case always is what it sort of involves is uh, it has a trigger or some sort of clinical based uh, problem the students will have to come up with different sorts of hypotheses uh, uh, clinical findings that they have to suggest uh, and sort of uh, you know argue uh, you know with, with one another and sort of try to come up with a, uh, a solution for the problem that's actually created as part of the case so that's uh, that's a group work learning which takes place uh, four hours every week. Uh, so two hours on Monday and two hours on Friday, and this is actually facilitated by the uh, tutors. Uh, and, uh, and 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 most of the students really enjoy this part of learning because this is where they actually can let their guard down and discuss as much as possible, like what they know. And so this is more and more for a comfortable surrounding for them. And. Uh, the other thing is that on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays is when the students are actually on campus. And this is where they actually get, uh, uh, you know, a lot of lectures. So I think it's about 10 lectures per week where they actually are scheduled and each lecture runs for about 45 to 50 minutes. And then, you know, they also have PBL, which is also a very important component of their teaching. And then they have ICMs, which is an introduction to clinical medicine where they actually placed into clinical schools, um, mainly on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, for year one, and I think year two, it sort of varies as well in terms of the days. So they get to spend about one and a half hours in the clinical schools. So that's that's a beauty for our school of medicine is that uh, initially when you just get immersed straight into the theoretical side of things where you're bombarded with lectures, tutorials and labs, you also get a chance to actually uh, visit the clinical schools and uh, along with the, uh, the junior doctors and the registries, you sort of get to shadow them and see the whole process and sort of take notes. I think very important is actually history taking you know, in the beginning phases of medicine, how to take a, how to get proper history taking and things like that. So that's also one component. The other thing is that, uh, so there's, there's a mixed level of assessment that we actually have. 
and there's quite a, you know, a large number, which I'm not going to highlight every single one of them today, but so long as you know that there's different components in uh, years one and two. We also have PPD, which is a uh, personal and professional development. This is, uh, you know, this is a uh, 10 hours per session for one semester. So this is where students actually get uh, together and think about, uh, you know, the, uh, the ethics and the uh, social and cultural significances of actually treating patients. And uh, there's also hospital-based sessions and workshops throughout the years one and two, which is all fascinating. Uh, years one and two, so I think the semester starts uh, late February, the teaching. And uh, for years one, you have, a, uh, for semester one, you have two main blocks. So first block is introduction to the human body, which takes about six weeks of learning. And the second block is the nutrition and metabolism block. So that's, that's the six and five weeks together. And then you have the first semester done, in the second semester, we, we introduce you guys to a second block of teaching, which is the GI block, the gastrointestinal <clears throat> block, then there's a cardiovascular block, and then finally ending up with the respiratory block. So breaking it up into different body systems is how we actually uh, like to teach, along with those uh, acting simultaneously is where you actually do your PBLs and your tutorials and your labs. Uh, years two, year two is uh, slightly different. You have same, same similar thing, whether you've broken down into different blocks, your renal, musculoskeletal and there's uh, immunology and infectious disease and cancer so different blocks and then you get exam examined on each of these different blocks as you uh, progress through you through the years one and two so um i think in total there's about 10 lectures per week and then you have pbls which is a mandatory requirement for all students it's about four hours of interaction per week and then there's practicals and labs which is again four hours per week and then there's ppds and mic's medicine in context and general practice um, uh, I think that we've got a very good um, system in place and it has works quite effectively, but I'm happy to, I don't have any slides up for you guys, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you do have any uh, specific questions you may have uh, regarding the, the actual content and things like that for years one and two. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Um, so, so we just wanted to show you a few images of uh, some of the facilities. So the image um, at the top is the main School of Medicine uh, facility on our Campbelltown campus. So Campbelltown, um, I'll ask Gerald to talk a bit more about um, the, the space at Campbelltown, but it's about 50 minutes um, out of, of the centre of the city, a direct uh, train line to um, the airport. And we find a lot of um, students from rural parts of Australia um, quite like our campus because it's, uh, it, it's um, there's there's lots of open space so it's not in the middle of a city area um we see lots of people going for walks around the campus because there are lakes with ducks and at certain times of the year you've got to make sure you avoid the ducks um the building on the bottom left is our clinical school at campbelltown hospital so the model um is that uh as Ritesh said, for one day a week in years one and two, you're based at one of these clinical schools. Um, and then in years three, four and five, um, you're predominantly either in hospital or other clinical settings or community settings. So that uh, clinical school on the left, MacArthur Clinical School is about uh, two or three years old. Um, and we've been having meetings in the last two days about a research center that will be going right next to it. Um, in the building at, on campus, the front part of that building uh, is teaching and, and uh, administrative space and the back or the longer part of the building is all of the research labs. So uh, Gerald and Ritesh's teams do all their pharmacological research in those labs. So you get a very strong mix of um, the sciences with um, infused in your teaching. Um, the bottom right then is the Blacktown Clinical School. So Blacktown is um, uh, on the way to the Blue Mountains, um, coming straight out from the city of uh, the centre of Sydney. And again, the wing you're seeing uh, to your right is the the teaching space, the library. So the hospital libraries in both cases are embedded in those buildings. And at Blacktown, there's um, clinic space, which is um, sort of to the end of the building. Um, so all very new facilities. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. 
I, I was just wondering, Fiona, um, whilst those a couple of questions have come up down the bottom, we might we might uh, just quickly deal with those uh, if that's OK. Um, uh, questions come in to Ritesh. What type of uh, uh, study schedule should students expect? Um, uh, I know you were covering uh, years one and two. Is it uh, five days a week? Uh, how many hours a week ordinarily would a student be uh, engaged uh, in learning? And does it run 12 months of the year? Uh, I think they're asking about the sort of semester times for that. I think, yep, I'm happy to take the question now. So the study schedule uh, for students, so this is a first year one, is an 80 credit point course, which means yeah, 40 credit point course per semester. So you're required to actually uh, you know, put in at least 40 hours per week in terms of study. So like I said, there's 10 hours, uh, 10 lectures per week, which is roughly equates to about 10 hours per week. And then there's components such as PBLs, PPDs, and PP, um, uh, practicals and labs. So on, so I think it's uh, it's all five, definitely five days a week. It's gonna take up all of that. So it's not, there's you, students in the past actually have managed to actually do some uh, part-time work as well. So, but uh, the Monday to Fridays is definitely, you have to be on campus and uh, also in your clinical schools and you'll be allocated dates and times and schedules and you have to run accordingly to those uh, systems. So it's not, it's not like a three day, but like I said earlier, three days on campus where you have, you know, have lectures and tutorials and PBLs. The other two days are going to be in your clinical schools where you get to learn the clinical side of things. Uh, the, the actual course, uh, 12 months per year. So the semester starts in, in late February and then there's a mid semester break, I think in uh, April or sometime. And then there's a the fifth semester break, which takes place in June. And then I think you have about a few weeks off, two to three weeks off. And then uh, the semester starts again in July, which runs all the way till at the end of October. And then you have the exams early November. And then you have a Christmas break vacation uh, from running. And then the clinical the years, the clinical years are a little longer. So they tend to start uh, at the end of January or beginning of February and run uh, till mid to late November. And uh, once you get into year three, so year three, four, five of the program, um, we, we describe as full time because you're going to be attached to clinical teams. So generally speaking, that will be five days a week. Occasionally, um, some teams may say, um, do you want to come in? I'm doing rounds on the weekend or um, there's a session at night. Um, obviously, those things are the exception, um, but they are all learning opportunities that students can avail themselves of. During those clinical years, there's also some uh, online teaching content um, called Scientific Streams. So they're developed between the um, scientists like Gerald and Ritesh and the clinicians to reinforce what you've learnt in years one and two as you start to engage with more clinical settings of um, disease. Okay, I, um, thank you, Fiona. I, I was uh, also, um, mentioned. I, I saw that uh, Gerald had uh, mentioned that uh, they could talk about uh, classes being online. Um, and we have a question from Ian uh, Stracy. Thank you, Ian. Uh, will semester one 2021 be instructed online? Um, and I wonder, uh, perhaps we could just mention how uh, things are going currently with the online teaching, uh, as uh, all teaching is at the moment. Um, I will say uh, we uh, semester two this year, which starts next week, um, is, is uh, online classes um, at the university. Um, we obviously are looking forward to 2021, hopefully returning uh, to normal. Uh, if possible, uh, depending on the pandemic situation. Um, but perhaps, uh, Fiona, uh, Ritesh, Gerald, uh, you could mention um, in regard to the online teaching at the moment. So maybe, maybe I could, yes, first of all, I have to apologize. I have a very strong German accent, which is actually telling the story about the multicultural um, uh, environment. No? So just think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, about 50 kilos, heavier and then so you get along. So um, the pandemic came quite uh, abrupt. So we started this year with uh, the orientation week for the medical students coming from overseas and everybody was thinking that it that the pandemic could be stopped like SARS-1 in uh, 10 years ago and would be all good. And then we had to move to online in March 
So at the moment is that everything is online except now the practical skills and the integrated clinical medicine that's already in the hospital because you can't learn to take blood online. <laughs> and uh, so far it has worked well. The lectures are online uh, as PDFs plus there is a recording of the lecture from last year. So the students listen to those lectures and for some uh, lectures which have changed and pharmacology always changes because the bloody drug companies produce a new drug every year. So we have a little bit of an update with a recorded lecture and the PBLs are online and the students log in via video conference and they discuss it. It's a uh, um, groups of 10 and that works as well. And so far, whatever the pandemic will be in 2021, we, we can we can be uh, flexible. So, so I guess it's also important to say that for different parts of the program, um, there were different experiences. So um, for the students who are in years three, four and five of the program in clinical placement, um, there were some um, what we called pauses really to some clinical experience because that was reflected in response to the health system. Um, so for instance, there was um, a reduction in elective surgery. So that meant that there was less surgery happening in the hospitals. And so what we did was um, structure the teaching so that students still had some experience of surgery and they did some supplementary learning as well. Um, the other thing that happened in New South Wales, which is the state um, in which we're based, is that um, our university, along with others, worked very closely with the um, our Ministry of Health and a number of our final year students, including international students, um, undertook um, exams early and additional training and are now contributing to providing workforce support as a part of continuing and completing their training and being able to graduate at the end of the year. So exactly what um, things look like for next year is, uh, we keep saying, you know, you used to say a week is a very long time and now you say a day is a very long time. Um, so we're very uh, hopeful um, and the, the governments in Australia are looking towards opportunities um, for students to be able to come because for things like medicine, as, as Gerald had said, there are some things that, um, it's not possible to do via this kind of situation. Um, so exactly what that means in terms of next year, I'll maybe leave Gareth to reflect on at the end. Um, but I think what we have to say is all anyone can do at the moment is plan for what we hope things will be um, and, and then work towards whatever things might be at that particular time. And, and Fiona, I had to say, no, the, as we know from some people, the virus will just disappear as uh, like a miracle. Okay, so on a more serious note, no, one of the questions was, is it an undergraduate degree? Is it a doctorate in medicine? No? And we can reflect on that one. So it's an undergraduate degree, but it's an MD program. So there will be a research project of nine weeks, and that leads to a, a master's qualification. It's not a PhD. A PhD would be an additional qualification. No, no, I'll discuss these and I think I think I've accidentally cut out year three, but I can talk about year three. Um, oh. So year three, I think I think my photos overlaid. Um, so the structure of year three of the course is um, that you have two lots of terms um, and those terms are, uh, um, I'm looking at my schedule, five weeks in uh, medical specialties and two lots of terms in surgical specialties. Um, a term in critical care, um, and then uh, a term in what we called medicine in context and general practice. So um, that's also now mixed in with the beginning of the work on the scholarly project or the research project, as Gerald mentioned. So year one, year three is your first full-time clinical experience, and that will be at one or other of the clinical schools. You then move into year four, which is what we sometimes refer to as the specialty year. Um, so it involves uh, placements in mental health, both acute and community-based mental health, obstetrics and gynaecology, 
paediatrics and oncology. Um, there's also the opportunity at the end of year four in the Christmas break to do an elective um, and some students uh, take that opportunity to go overseas. Um, others choose to focus on um, a particular uh, discipline that they're really interested in and they may again do that uh, locally, interstate or overseas. But we encourage people to go to a hospital other than the main hospitals they're training in um, because we think that seeing lots of different healthcare environments in action and learning from lots of different people is very good for you. As we said, we've got then this scholarly project that you'd actually start thinking about. We're just launching that as part of the MD uh, for the end of year two this year. And so that will be then done across year three and year four. And then the final year of the course, year five, um, we reinforce that medical and surgical term. So again, more of those placement terms, another term in critical care. And obviously your capacity to engage in uh, activities in, in those terms is much different in your final year than it was in your first clinical year. So there's lots that you've learnt um, through the specialty areas that, in, that increase your uh, capacity in those areas. We've got a full five week general practice term or what's often um, I know referred to in Canada as um, primary or family uh, medicine um, and Indigenous health. So all of our students spend five weeks in an Aboriginal medical service, um, usually in regional or remote New South Wales. Um, that tends, you do that in, in pairs and that's learning um, from and with uh, not so much the doctors but the Aboriginal health workers, um, and the different support workers in those communities. Um, so I can't remember what slide we had next. Sorry, Gareth, I, that I might think, be... Um, we're, we're moving over to me, but there is a question from Aksha, which, which is uh, particularly pertinent um, to this part. Um, uh, Aksha is asking how many years of clinical rotations are necessary after graduating from this program? I, I, I wonder if we uh, might just discuss the, the sort of pre-graduation clinical rotation duration and what happens afterwards. Sure, sure. So um, what we've taken you through here is um, the what's within the degree. So again, the structures of, of how these work in different countries is a bit different. So at the point that you complete your degree and graduate from university, um, you are then eligible to be registered in Australia by the Medical Board of Australia as having what's called provisional registration. In order then to obtain full registration, you're required to undertake one year of additional training. Now, that is managed in New South Wales by the Health and Education Training Institute, or HETI, um, but it's very important for me to say, and I probably have to say it twice, that um, that is not guaranteed for international students and the university has no influence over whether international students are able to obtain internships in Australia. Um, I can say that again, but um, on the other hand, I would say that a number of international students have stayed in Australia. So we can't guarantee it and the university has no influence in that process but we do have a history of some international students who've um, been very keen to continue their medical careers uh, in Australia, at least up until that next stage, um, and have, have undertaken to do that. Others have returned um, to home or elsewhere to continue their degree, uh, not their degree, their medical training. So the structure then of, of medical training in Australia is after you've obtained your full registration and usually done one or two years um, post-graduation is that you can then commence applying for uh, entry into the specialty training programs. So whether that's becoming a general practitioner or family physician, um, a paediatrician, an oncologist. So those programs um, then take five plus years generally. But um, the thing I explain to, to the students at our open days is um, the point at which you start earning money 
is at the point that you've graduated and you start an internship. So all of the training that you do after that point is you're doing while you're employed in those areas as well. So I hope, um, Axka, that was us answering the question that you were asking. Yeah, I, I, and I just wanted to add, so in, in the five year sequence that exists on our Doctor of Medicine degree, um, if I'm not mistaken, Fiona, so years three, four, and five are these uh, clinical rotations um, where they're uh, doing uh, a, a much more practical focus. You graduate after five years, and then there is a, a one-year compulsory internship, um, which is required for full registration. Okay. Yes. That, that's great. So, uh, um, and I, I think because... It, from my understanding as well, a lot of the uh, domestic students, well, a lot of students are very keen to find an internship uh, in Sydney. Um, but if students uh, are more flexible with the destination uh, for internship and uh, uh, willing to, you know, move and travel around, um, they'll have a much greater chance of securing one uh, around New South Wales. And there have been targeted um, programs in the past um, from the federal government that have targeted international students in different locations and they've tended to be in um, regional uh, places. Now that doesn't mean the, the, the middle of the outback. Um, sometimes that can be coastal but our regional um, cities, so I know for instance there's uh, been some international students who've been keen to, because um, our domestic students do some compulsory rural training and some of the international students hear about it too and it's because of their friendships and knowledge of those things that they've then uh, been interested in pursuing those opportunities. So um, in different locations, either up um, towards Queensland where Gareth said he's hoping to go for holidays <laughs> if and when that's possible um, and our clinical school in Bathurst, which is about two hours on the other side of the Blue Mountains from Sydney. Um, yeah. Okay, so hopefully that, that gives uh, our, our guest today a little bit of a, a, an understanding of, of what's required. So just to repeat that sort of five year study sequence and after, after you graduate, one year of internship to then get full registration uh, in Australia. So um, I think the next slides, um, are relating it does then shift yeah just into student support um this is where i was going to uh take take back over but please uh um gerald ritesh if you want to uh, uh, join me with any uh, additional comments here i just wanted to um stress that the university we're a very large comprehensive university and of course uh, our student support is is uh, a critical component of all of our um offerings to uh, our students both domestic and international um, but some of the things that um, obviously are there are listed here for, for the, the general student support. Um, academic literacy, often obviously with students from Canada, uh, academic literacy is, is less of a concern than, than say if we're recruiting students uh, into our uh, programs from, from different countries where English is not the, uh, the main language. But we've got lots of other programs like the peer assisted study, the MATES program, this idea that you're uh, you're connected with other students when you arrive to in, to ensure that you've got that sort of uh, buddy, uh, a system whereby you can get, gain access to other students to help you and guide you through, particularly at the start. But of course, there's a full range of uh, student welfare um, services as well, counselling and disability. Um, and uh, just in terms of uh, some of this, um, there's also work around uh, um, the uh, uh, career counselling as well, obviously for students of medicine, uh, there's a particular direction, but um, you can utilise the services of our, our career hub to help you and assist you. And this may uh, well come into uh, 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 use when you're seeking internship later. Um, the last slide, ah, yeah, so just in terms of uh, campus locations, as Fiona touched on, uh, we're about a 50 minute uh, journey uh, from Sydney city centre. The map I'm showing you here uh, is the whole greater Sydney conurbation. You can see the Blue Mountains on the left-hand side. 
Um, and then the red areas listed here are our campus locations for Western Sydney University. Campbelltown's down in the southwest. Um, and as Fiona mentioned, about 50 minutes outside Sydney City Centre, which is over by the coast there. So um, you can see that in the next slide if I show you Sydney City Centre is there. And then uh, again, we're, uh, we're in between, uh, sorry, the uh, airport is in between the city centre and Campbelltown. The nice, the nice thing about the campus area, um, it, as you move towards the southwestern uh, suburbs of Sydney, you get much more of that sort of urban rural fringe. So it's nice, peaceful location, uh, a good place to be studying, um, uh, away from all of those diversions of the uh, of the city centre, perhaps. But it's just on your doorstep. So um, we've got a very uh, beautiful um, city environment for you: beaches, mountains, and of course a quite peaceful and tranquil area uh, down in the Campbelltown location. And, and I guess we should say if, um, you know, when we say mountains, don't get overexcited. This is not, this is, this is my, my brother lives between the Columbia um, and Rocky mountain ranges and, and you know, so, so mountains isn't mountains, but it's very picturesque. Um, and Campbelltown has, uh, you know the advantages of being have, having good services but not in the middle of things so um the so it's well, i'm glad um gareth's going to talk about the accommodation because we find lots of um international students at the beginning of their course go into accommodation at campus and there's then um and sorry if i'm getting ahead of us but um a, a, a shuttle bus that goes uh to the, to the shops and the train station but also um, to the hospital and what we try and do is uh, if there are students who are living on campus we try and make sure that we've aligned you to that hospital so that you've got easy access uh, when you first arrive sorry Gareth no no all good and, and that's exactly right I mean um, in the southwest uh, area where we are Campbelltown itself is like a, a, a little mini uh, sort of uh, uh, micro like urban environment uh, as a as a, a kind of center point um, retail you know a kind of uh, uh, location for businesses as well in the southwest of Sydney and of course it's serviced by um, quite a large hospital there um, which is uh, where we have that principal connection for our uh, uh, training but the the campus location is just on the uh, other side of the Campbelltown uh, MacArthur train station. And of course, on campus, uh, apart from all the sort of standard uh, university campus facilities of, you know, a library and the teaching buildings, we also have the accommodation there as well. And I've just um, uh, put up on screen a, an image of the uh, accommodation buildings there. There's a range of different options. There's quite a lot of students um, that stay on the Campbelltown campus. And the, the unit block uh, I've um, shown here in this, this is a combination of different three, four bedroom units. Um, that the students stay in, but we've also got townhouses and, and, and a whole uh, uh, array of different buildings. I just wanted to give you a sense of costings and that and the different layouts. Um, so this is all in uh, Australian dollars um, and hopefully you can see this is our 2020 pricing, but they usually start if you're in a five bed apartment that's uh, from about 190 Australian dollars. Um, and but if you want your own uh, privacy and uh, um, we have these studio apartments as well, which is your entire you know own space that obviously comes at a, an additional cost. But plenty of different accommodation options and a lot of our um, uh, uh, clinical health uh, students um, stay on campus. Campbelltown is uh, one of the major centers of, of, of the of the uh, 11 campuses that we live on. Uh, Campbelltown is uh, has a sort of a concentration of clinical uh, and allied health programs. So we also teach uh, undergraduate nursing uh, and a range of other health science programs, including some programs, uh, you know, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and other such uh, uh, allied and clinical health programs, along with medicine. So it's it's uh, uh, if you like a hub for Western Sydney uh, in the health area. And paramedicine. If you can ever crash a barbecue, it's the paramed barbecues that you want to crash. <laughs> exactly. Um, so once again, a little image of our uh, uh, um, purpose-built School of Medicine building on Campbelltown campus. Um, and uh, if I just go in now to the entry requirements, some, uh, I'm not sure if there's other questions. Where is, where is uh, before we start, can I actually, because I live on campus, I can actually put my camera out 
and the students can see how the how our how our um, um, so don't look at my untidy apartment or house, no? but this is actually how it looks outside. So we have a terrible winter's day. No? So you can All see right. you can see the School of Medicine there. So on the left, it's big building, the School of Medicine. This is the train line coming in. So and this is the new sports center, which is just built as we speak. So when you arrive, you might have uh, access to facilities probably near two with a swimming pool and um, soccer fields and everything, which is just about 50 meters, 100 meters away from the, from the from the campus. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Chair. And it's a terrible, a wind terrible wind. cold winter day. Terrible cold winter day. And um, um, we expect a 19 degrees today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, and I guess yeah, the yeah. other thing just to, to reflect on is, um, the cohort size is quite small. So um, I know there are some universities that have hundreds and hundreds of students in each cohort. The cohort size is, is around 130 um, each year and a, and a mix of our international student mix is, is quite broad. Um, and as Gareth said, um, that, that reflects um, our mix of um, diversity of our domestic students as well. Um, and because you mixed up then in different groups for problem-based learning, as Ritesh said, and different groups in the hospital for introduction to clinical medicine, you meet uh, people quite early. Um, Gerald and I, as the pandemic was getting started, were planning the annual international student barbecue, um, where we bring international students from all the years onto campus. Um, we started by thinking, oh, we can do that, normal, everything good. Then we thought, well, we can do it if we've got separate food. Um, and then um, things uh, things were such that we haven't been able to hold that this year. Um, but there's been lots of um, online interaction between the students. And the first year students who didn't actually have as much time together have bonded really well. We've been really pleased about that. But also to say the students I keep saying medical students study hard because they have to. It's not easy. It's a heavy study load. But they have fun pretty hard too. Um, again, this year we missed out on one of my favourite annual events, which is um, a, a, med a music night, which they tend to hold outside, um, outside the building and make and sell cupcakes. Um, we've got people doing reciting poetry, doing Bollywood dancing, um, singing and playing guitar. It's one of my favourite nights. There's also usually a med review if you're a performer um, or if you're a backstage person and you like doing that kind of thing. There's an annual uh, soccer competition between staff and students. Um, there's lots of other campus clubs as well um, that are not just med school exclusive. So. Um, you don't have to try hard to find social activity. What is hard is balancing your uh, social and, and study interests. I can see Ritesh nodding when I say that. <laughs> yeah. I have to say something about the pride. So the, the residence is usually the first of sort of uh, the first accommodation for the students. No? And uh, it's for a single room, it's reasonably priced. And it's half price compared to the city. You know? On the other hand, if you then find maids and some students, you know, often students rent out uh, a four-bedroom house you know, uh, in MacArthur Heights or in Campbell in uh, Campbell Cove, um, Park Central, which is between the hospital and the university. And you get a four-bedroom house for about six hundred per week. That means if four students live there, you go down to 150 Australian dollars per week. And that's usually the, the, the accommodation students choose after they have found people they can sort of live with. And the best the best places are the ones where it's like a year four student and a year three student, you know, and they can teach each other what's actually happening. So these are the best communities, and there's lots of them. And as we said, there's a shuttle bus between the university and the train station and the shops and the hospital going every 15 minutes free of charge. So and that's good for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, Gerald. Yeah, it, it is important to mention that, and uh, you'll find the on-campus accommodation, as I as I showed in the previous slide. Yeah, is it, 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 what what you get in terms of that is um, all bills are included, so there's no sort of additional cost apart from food, and maybe your SIM card for your mobile phone. Everything else is there. Um, but of course, when you move out, the the rental cost can come right down, and particularly in southwestern uh, suburbs. It's quite a, um, a, a a sort of economical place. You get a you get a lot for your money uh, in terms of renting a, in, in a house share or an apartment share with other students, and of course the hospitals on your doorstep and the university is also there. And and Macarthur Campbelltown, it's a, a very large retail precinct and uh, uh, restaurants, cafes, and and all the other um, uh, bits and pieces. And if you want the diversions of uh, the city centre, you can hop on the train, which is right next to the station, uh, right next to the campus as well, and you're into the city um, within an hour. So uh, it's got those uh, uh, options for you. Now, up on the slide, entry requirements, key information. This is critical for uh, all you students um, considering applications. Now, the slides I've got are a little bit um, involved, but I just wanted to go through. So, um, how we how we actually um, assess you is based on your high school qualification, um, but we also have students who've completed uh, either their full bachelor degree already or part of their bachelor degree. So I just wanted to highlight here, um, we have the standard uh, international uh, qualifications in A-level or IB diploma, but for the Canadian students, um, I've just put up the Ontario uh, secondary school diploma. So uh, six university college preparation courses with an overall average of 86%. This is, this is the cutoff point, the threshold that is on our government um, equivalency tables matching to an Australian ATAR of 93.5, which is the threshold point of your academic qualification. Some of you listening today might have um, uh, another Canadian province qualification. I haven't listed all of them, but um, if you are doing particularly well, um, obviously within that uh, uh, particular system, then you're looking at a, a kind of that equivalence to the Ontario one uh, of 86. Um, or if you've come from a bachelor degree, we have our, um, if you've completed, we in Australia and Western Sydney operate off a GPA 7 uh, scale. So if your GPA is an equivalent to 5.2 out of 7 on your completed bachelor, that again meets the threshold for an a a ATAR of uh, 93.5 equivalency. If you've completed just one year of a bachelor degree and you're looking to transfer and move into our uh, uh, Doctor of Medicine program, then your GPA after year one would need to be more like 5.9 out of seven. You must be performing at an academic level that is very strong. So um, what we would invite you to do is to, um, via uh, Com Consultants, is make an application to us and we can assess your uh, qualification uh, as it stands. I'll come to the application procedure in a second, but just other, other entry uh, requirements. Um, we require our, our uh, applicants to take a, uh, an ISAT as well, um, which can be uh, uh, taken on, uh, uh, online. Um, so the ISAT uh, is, a, is a system, uh, an aptitude test that you're required to also submit. You don't have to submit it right at the start, um, but it is an important ingredient in uh, application for us to assess you. Um, typically, students on a scale of 200 are achieving 160 plus. Uh, we would be expecting that. Candidates as well who've been in the uh, Canadian education system for six years uh, won't need to uh, uh, supply any evidence of English. You must obviously have completed your qualifications in Canada, um, but it is important. If, as some Canadian uh, applicants uh, uh, that we uh, uh, get applications from, they may have only been in Canada for a couple of years, and they may have come from a, 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 a country overseas where English is not the medium of instruction, uh, or indeed uh, the principal uh, first language. Those students um, may well be asked for an IELTS score. So it all depends on how long you've been at high school or within the education system in Canada. Uh, but uh, we are looking for a, a sequence of completed six years of education uh, in an English-speaking country. These are the regulations, actually, that are uh, stipulated by APRA, the uh, Health Practitioners Accreditation Body in Australia. It is a fundamental requirement that you uh, are evidencing a level of English that is suitable for uh, APRA 
uh, as we call it. So this is not uh, specifically our rule. It's the rule of the uh, health practitioners uh, accrediting body. So um, there's a question I see from uh, Zoheb. Uh, can MCAT be substituted for ISAT? Um, Fiona, I'm not sure in terms of uh, that question about MCAT, but I am aware that ISAT is the specific program that we do request. Uh, any additional comment, Fiona? Um, so, so I'm not aware of um, MCAT. Um, I'd, in, a, in Australia, the um, assessment device we use for domestic students is the UCAT, um, University Clinical aptitude test which is um also a um uh, undertaken in the uk um there is some talk in the future about um whether it might be used so i'm not sure if mcat is another version of um that but um as things stand for the 2021 entry um the requirement is the isat yeah so I, I can see uh, Zahab's also additionally asked all the UCAT British version. So uh, I think for 2021 next intake, ISAT is the is the only uh, aptitude test that we are accepting. Um, so those other ones uh, won't be considered. Um, so just uh, for that information. Um, um, Risha Rajesh is also asking, do we need to include resume or reference letters? Um, I would suggest, uh, Risha, um, it's not a, a, a a particular necessity, but a resume is always very useful for us uh, when making our assessments. Um, uh, we would um, uh, su suggest also uh, in any application that you write a statement of purpose. Students are typically, we, we'd like to see why it is you wish to study, um, uh, what your uh, ambitions are and goals beyond the study program. So what we call an SOP, a statement of purpose, is a, a, a useful inclusion. So uh, reference letters, not necessary, um, but certainly a resume and a statement of purpose is a very uh, useful inclusion in your application. Um, so uh, I can see Zahav, you're asking, all other Australian schools use MCAT or GAMSAT for international applicants. Um, I'm and and sure. Sue's just commented that MCAT's used for graduate entry. So that would align to it being used for graduate programs because GAMSAT uh, is the test that's used uh, domestically for graduate programs. So one of the conversations we have with students on open days is um, the test that you're required to do generally relates to um, the, the course you're going into, not your um, experience. So in Australia, for, for domestic students, the undergraduate programs use the UCAT and the graduate programs um, use the GAMSAT. Um, we are exploring whether the UCAT in the future might be uh, appropriate for international applicants as well, but that um, that will not be resolved for the 2021 intake. So at the moment and, 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 is the ISAT. Yeah, and, and I think just to sort of uh, uh, contribute as well, in terms of the different medical programs that are available in Australia, uh, Zahab, uh, our program is one of just a small number of undergraduate medicine programs, this five-year sequence that leads to Doctor of Medicine. There are other Australian universities that are offering a graduate medicine program. They will have required you to have completed a bachelor degree first, and you would then go on for a, an additional, I think, four years of uh, medical study after your completed bachelor degree on a graduate medicine program. Our program is one that is uh, an undergrad classified as an undergraduate medicine program over a five year sequence that will lead um, to registration, full registration. So as a I'm, I'm doctor of medicine. Um, so hopefully that clarifies some of our entry requirements there. Um, on the next slide, uh, just in terms of costing, um, in, this is all in Australian dollars, I have to stress, so you'll need to do your comparison. Um, but our current fees for 2020 are 67,000 per year, which is um, in comparison to other Australian universities, uh, uh, quite a reasonable uh, price. Um, and there will be likely for 2021 a small uh, increase. Typically, um, fees increase each year just by maybe four or five percent. So please factor that in. The intake is March the 1st, 2021. Um, application deadline. Technically speaking, um, student, there isn't necessarily a, a deadline as such. We take applications on a rolling basis. 
Um, what you have to ensure as a student, though, is that you've made an application in good time. We have a quoted number of international places available uh, for students on our uh, uh, Doctor of Medicine program, um, typically around 32. And this will mean that it's essentially first come, first serve. So all of those students that have effectively sent in their qualifying documents and that pass all uh, of our entry requirements, as I've mentioned on the previous slide, will be offered an unconditional offer, which they're free to accept. Once we've taken uh, 32 of those, we will close the program. Um, so that means that there are places still available um, for, the, for the March intake. Usually in December, January, there are still some available, but not many. So I would encourage you um, to submit your application uh, now. Uh, if you have your high school qualification completed, please um, forward that um, with your application. If you've got those other, the ISAT um, uh, and the English uh, uh, qualification completed, that might allow you to get an unconditional offer uh, uh, um, right now, which gives you plenty of time. Um, for So really it's first come first serve uh, uh, in terms of uh, admission. But you have to leave time to process your visa as well and to sort of uh, make all of those arrangements for accommodation and so on. Um, I would suggest that now is a good time to make an application um, and to consider um, uh, uh, the ISAT uh, test as well. And if you haven't been in Canada long enough, um, uh, uh, six years of education, you will need to submit an IELTS score as well, where you need four, seven grades to uh, comply with the Australian regulations. Um, we don't interview uh, 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 students as well uh, currently, um, though uh, uh, if the school have any uh, 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 concerns or, or issues, they may wish to talk to you um, uh, as part of your application. But typically, no interview is required. Um, and then just over onto the procedure, um, our recommendation is to um, connect with Con consultants um, there in Ontario, uh, talk to them about your uh, circumstances, your application. Um, we uh, can then uh, um, have you submit your um, application online. Uh, with your official high school qualification grades or maybe your university uh, transcript grades. We would make a provisional offer if all the pieces are not there. Um, once you've submitted ISAD, evidenced your English, um, we can then um, uh, issue an unconditional offer, which you can then accept. Uh, acceptance comes with the first semester fee payment. So that's an equivalent of approximately uh, 34,000 Australian dollars and that will secure your place for the following intake. Um, so that um, that summarizes uh, the, the process for application. I can see there's a couple of questions that come uh, come in. Uh, yeah, we, we recommend you, you contact Con for your application. We have students from uh, Canada every year commencing our program, um, and uh, Con consultants are our, our key uh, education agent partner um, within Canada to help you and assist you with your uh, application and, of course, also your student visa application. Um, Richard, you're asking, is there an accommodation package for students going into the program? Uh, accommodation is an additional uh, component to the tuition fees that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so accommodation is typically you can buy uh, a semester. So as Ritesh mentioned earlier, we typically begin at the end of February going through to June. You could uh, uh, purchase, in terms of accommodation, a six-month uh, accommodation package on top of that. So depending on the particular apartment uh, uh, type you're in, that would um, constitute a, uh, a payment additional to your tuition fee of $67,000. Um, so it, you're, you're looking at, a, a, on average, there about 200 and uh, maybe 210 on average, 220 dollars per week uh, for Campbelltown accommodation. So multiplied by 24 weeks um, for your initial six months. Uh, Sue's asking, if a student gets an offer, is there a specific time frame or deadline in which they have to accept? Uh, good question. Well, as we as we operate our program, uh, Sue, on a, uh, a rolling acceptance model, um, it means you can apply at any time. Um, our recommendation is if you get an unconditional offer, 
as, as mentioned, we have a quota of places available and we will we will take acceptances until we filled and then uh, we, we cut that off. So if you do get an unconditional offer and Sydney uh, as, a, as a destination for your study uh, is, is one that you'd like to go ahead with, uh, and we would recommend it, of course, um, I, would, I would urge uh, uh, any applicant to accept that offer at the earliest. Um, we fill our quota every year and it means that students will will potentially miss out. So, um, yeah, there, there isn't a particular deadline to accept by, but we we will typically fill all of our places by, say, early January. So uh, please consider yeah, that. Can I, can I have something from last, from last year? Yeah. So we actually had to set a deadline to about think, two weeks, at, really at the end, because we had one or two, one or two places left and three potential applicants you know, and we want to make sure that they're not endlessly dragging it out because the visa takes time so we set deadlines yes. at the end of november for two weeks huh? and that was sort of snapped up the last place was snapped up within a day okay yeah um um per etap, um for those students who've completed post-secondary studies are the cutoff grades weighted 50 50 between secondary and tertiary study or is it strictly based on most recent? Strictly based on most recent. So our admissions unit, um, Peretap would would uh, review. You've completed high school. You then go on to university. We would be looking at your university grades. So say if you've completed one year, we would be seeking an equivalency of um, a GPA score of five point nine out of uh, uh, seven in order for you to qualify uh, and reach the threshold level of academic uh, standard. So that's what we do. So we, we're not looking back at the, uh, uh, at the high school grades specifically. So um, it's what your most recent study is what we look at. Um, is the attrition rate for students in the program relatively low? Good question. Um, so uh, uh, perhaps uh, Ritesh, Gerald, Fiona, uh, how, how is attrition um, within the medicine degree very low um, which is not to say that there aren't students who um, may have personal circumstances that we, we don't encourage breaks in in the course but there are students from time to time whose personal situation may require that so what we do see is that that can happen um, occasionally um, and there is also, and and I'll just be blunt here in saying this, you have to pass each year to progress each year. So um, from time to time that, you know, students may also um, not do as well as they need to to progress. And it's important that those standards are maintained because what we're training you to do um, will put you in life and death situations. So the attrition rate in terms of people not completing is very low, um, but there may be instances where it takes students longer, either because they've not achieved the academic requirements or there are personal circumstances, um, whether that's um, illness, for instance, that might mean their progress through the course uh, is longer than the standard progress. Mm -hmm. And Fiona, we can say we usually start with 130 students new and we graduate 110. So that's sort of the average over the last years. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, um, uh, Gerald and Fiona. I'm, I'm not sure um, for the guests listening today, um, are there any other questions? Or if, Sue, um, I haven't covered anything or we haven't uh, covered anything um, that might be of uh, uh, assistance to those listening and, and to your team um, in, uh, at, at COM. But uh, um, if, uh, if there aren't any further questions, I do encourage you just to sort of round up uh, to consider a, a, an application. Um, we, uh, as I say, have quite a healthy number of international places available at Western Sydney University. Um, so uh, there are many universities offering medicine degrees uh, in Australia, but not all of them will have such a large international quota. So I do encourage you to, uh, to make an application. Our admissions team, so um, talk to uh, Sue and the team there at Com Consultants. 
in in uh, uh, there in in uh, Ontario. They can talk to you about the whole application process and liaise directly with our admissions team. So, um, as I mentioned, if you if you're ready with the qualifications we can generate an offer very quickly, in fact. So there's not a, a huge amount of uh, uh, work involved in making an application uh, to Western Sydney. Uh, and then as I say, with the uh, available places, uh, uh, an offer can be uh, issued fairly quickly and you've then got that opportunity to consider that and uh, make your acceptance. So um, I think uh, we can uh, finish up there um fiona any any uh final comments uh no it's it's been good to spend this this um time with everyone this morning um or this evening as the case may be um and we hope that uh this has answered some questions you may have had and also has provided you with some information um that you hadn't been aware of before um there's some general information about the the course and the university but also um, the university and schools research activity um, on the website that I'd also encourage people to have a look at as well. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, good point. Um, and uh, uh, Gerald? Yeah, can I ask for, uh, uh, at one thing, we have a special orientation week for the national students before the normal start, and that uh, ends with uh, the lifesavers telling us how to swim in the Wollongong Beach. So that's the... Uh, <laughs> We also meet the police and career service and the insurance companies. No? And one of the coolest things they handed out to the students were stickers from the police saying, top cops are, are tops. And putting that sticker on your car, you never get pulled up. No? So <laughs> this is a week of, of uh, international students' orientation to the Australian lifestyle. Excellent. Um, okay, and thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah, have a nice Thursday evening uh, in Canada. And I've left my email address up on screen. Uh, Sue has also uh, put hers up at Com Consultant. So if there are any questions that crop up later that you haven't uh, asked today, you can fire an email uh, to myself or Sue and we'll happily uh, answer your question. So uh, thank you, everybody. And thanks, Team School of Medicine, uh, for your input. Okay. We'll finish Bye. there. Thank you. Bye Thanks. Bye. I might, G Gerald and Ritesh, I'll just send you a, um, and Gareth a quick Zoom so we can do a little debrief. Uh, ah, yeah. no worries. No. I'll send it by email. Okay. Bye. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.